All right. I am Todd Green. I'm an associate professor in marketing at the Goodman School of Business at Brock. Um, and this is our eighth year, um, well, eighth year of planning and seventh year of executing um, a business matters discussion. This year, we are tackling climate change and what it means for business, both locally um, in Niagara and beyond. And so it is our second year of virtual gatherings, hopefully knock on wood last, and we'll be in person <laughs> when we pick a topic for next year. Um, what I'd also like to do is to begin this gathering by acknowledging the land on which Brock University was built. Uh, it's traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anish Anishinaabe, um, many of whom continue to live and work here today. Um, this territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Um, today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and acknowledging reminds us that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of Indigenous people. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank our panel for being part of this. Um, and also thank the great team um, from Goodman that I worked with setting up the event, um, Susan, Kate, Daniel, and Darby. Um, and so what we'd like to do is have the panelists introduce themselves. So we can start with uh, Jessica Blythe, please. Thank you, Todd. Um, good evening, everyone. Warm welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jessica Blythe. I'm an assistant professor in the Environmental Sustainability Research Center at Brock. Uh, I'm trained as a social scientist and um, a large portion of my research uh, involves trying to understand how communities are vulnerable to climate change and also how we can build adaptive capacity and resilience um, to climate change. Really lovely to be here. Great. Thanks so much. Natalie. Hey, uh, thanks Todd for inviting me. And um, my name is Natalie Lowe. I operate a destination management company here in Niagara called uh, Celebrate Niagara. I've lived in the Niagara region for about 24 years, so I guess I'm kind of starting to be a local. Um, about four years ago, I started the Sustainable Events Forum, and it's really dedicated to teaching those of us in the events industry how to host more sustainable events. Um, but also encouraging us to have our attendees at all of our events learn much more about climate action. So happy to be here. Thank you so much, Natalie, and for returning the favor. I had a, a great chance to speak at one of your events before. It was it was awesome. Um, Michaela. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me today on the panel. My name is Michaela Richards. I actually graduated from Brock in 2019 from the Goodman School of Business, where I also have a minor in environmental sustainability. Uh, I currently work now at EcoVadis as a sustainability analyst, and we are the world's uh, one of the world's largest uh, uh, providers of business sustainability ratings. And we assess companies' uh, sustainability management systems on four different themes, environment, labor and human rights, business ethics, and sustainable procurement. I started there back in January 2021 in their Toronto office. Um, yeah, and I'm very happy to be a part of the panel today. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, Gabriel. Uh, thank you, Todd. Thank you for having me uh, and uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Gabriel DeMarco. I am the uh, head winemaker and viticulturalist at Cape Spring Vineyard in the Niagara region. Um, it's a pretty great honor to be the head winemaker at Cape Spring as uh, I've taken over for the storied Angelo Pavan, who still works with me uh, collaboratively. Uh, it's, it's one of the storied uh, vineyards in the region. And I went to the company for the vineyards and stayed for the people. And we are surrounded by 133 acres of protected uh, land. And we take that very seriously. So we have a lot of um, environmental initiatives and partnerships, both in industry uh, with the universities and with the government to advance both um, our standards and the standards of the industry. So I was very excited to be part of the panel and to have the discussions that we need to be having uh, to move uh, these things forward culturally. Thank you for having me. Great, thanks Gabriel. Um, so the first question, it, it's pretty big and it's pretty broad, so I invite you to take it in many different directions. Um, but we, we do wanna know and discuss what does climate change mean for current and future business models? 
and there's no set order. So if whoever wants to jump in, feel free. Well, um, I'm going to go first because I think my industry, the events industry, is going to be drastically affected. Um, the current target of 1.5 degrees Celsius warming means that going forward, one international conference, one three-day international conference would use up your climate budget or your emissions for half the year. So we know that if the events industry is going to be successful through the climate emergency, we need to drastically reduce our, our emissions. Um, I guess I can chime in for uh, currently, um, we, it's, it's, it's a, we're dealing with generational employees. Uh, and so I think it's quite important in the short term to start to evolve the culture of the way we do business. Uh, and you can't just walk into a business and say, uh, at, especially with people who have been there for 20 plus years or the generation that been working in an industry and say, tomorrow, this is how the change happens. You need to like proactively set up initiatives that allow businesses to evolve in time. Unfortunately, in the situation, we should have been doing this in you know the 80s, uh, but here we are. Uh, and so uh, we have to be proactive and rapidly changing that culture in a way that is sustainable to like the workforce. Um, and so um, viticulturally uh, and, and from a winemaking point of view, actually, as well, like basically like really uh, bringing people along in a positive way to change the way we think about doing business, which is uh, which is the uh, which is the big which is the big hurdle. Yeah, we did uh, talk I'm before and I was just going to quickly say that the idea of change is scary that for sure, even with when we think of holding virtual events or teaching virtually has been a, or working virtually has been a huge change for all of us. Sorry, Jessica, go ahead. No, no, that segues nicely into my quote. I was going to quote Margaret Atwood, who famously said, it's not climate change, it's everything change. And I think that we're all starting to feel that, um, you know, with climate events that used to seem kind of far away, maybe geographically or in terms of if they're in the future, um, you know, as Canadians, we all watched as BC had back-to-back -back record heat waves and record fires, and then four months later, record flooding. And so I think for a lot of us, it's feeling closer to home. Uh, you know, so we are, I think the um, maybe groundswell for change is coming because we are feeling that a lot of those, you know, we're feeling the impacts locally uh, as well as globally now. Um, but I think like maybe the good news story about that is that the support uh, amongst people here in Niagara is really growing for um, climate action. So I was really fortunate to be involved in a work, uh, partnership that did a survey with over a thousand people from Niagara in 2020, I believe it was, and 85% of the people that we talked to, so over 850 people were in support of taking, you know, immediate action on climate uh, in the region. So I think that the, the changes are big, uh, the, the barriers are large, but the support is there. And, and so I think that's maybe one good news story um, in terms of what it looks like going forward. Yeah, and uh, building off of what everyone has said and that the uh, people are starting to recognize, I think with, as we're seeing these climate events happen and even with the pandemic, which is a, I would say a byproduct of partly climate change, we're noticing that businesses need to be flexible and they need to adapt. And they're going to possibly have to change their business model. I actually went to a webinar where Oatly, um, which is a popular oat milk brand, had to completely change their business model because of the pandemic, moving from a B2B business where they were only selling to local specialty coffee shops, which didn't work anymore and had to go to a B2, B2C, so completely changing their marketing strategy and everything. So it's not just pandemics, it's, it's like, as we mentioned, natural disasters. So navigating this and making sure that you have a strong sustainability management system in place can definitely help businesses transition and implement sustainable action while also still being effective and minimizing the impact. So definitely everything. So now that we know that everything is is going to change, um, one thing I, I did want to talk, it's, it's interesting because I talked to Jess a long time ago when I said, I think because I live across from a vineyard and I can walk to another one and I see trees and there's green space, 
and there's the the Brock Park and the monument around me, it doesn't feel as immediate, I think, when you live in Niagara. And even, yes, there are obviously lots of roads and highways and stuff, but my drive to Brock, it was, there's fields everywhere. And so you don't have that immediate sense, I don't think. Um, you can also probably choose to ignore it when there there are signs as well. Um, so I did want to focus on what does this mean for Niagara businesses and actually um, consumers as well in, in Niagara? I know consumers is sort of a loaded word, so perhaps general population is a, a nicer way of, of framing it. Um, I might jump in first if you guys don't mind, because I cannot speak on behalf of business like you can, um, but I can definitely speak to the impacts of climate change in Niagara. And that was a, a really good point, Todd, is a lot of it is unfelt uh, to many of us who live here in Niagara, but we are starting to experience impacts that are really actually changing the way that we live and work in the region as well. So um, I think when we when we look at what's happening in Niagara in terms of the weather that we're experiencing, it can be described as warmer, wetter, and wilder, meaning we're, we are experiencing higher temperatures, we are experiencing more rainfall and in more unpredictable patterns, and we are experiencing wilder weather. Um, you know, as a tangible example, I live in Pelham, and we used to have the town arches that we would have our festivals underneath, and they blew down in a windstorm and were damaged, um, and now are gone because we just weren't prepared for the intensity of those storms. Um, so I do think that, you know, here in Niagara, we are experiencing flood events that are changing agricultural production. Um, they're changing, uh, you know, the way that we can use the lakeshore, um, for example, we're having roads um, become washed out. And I know I will let you guys speak to it more clearly, but disruptions like that have impacts directly on businesses in terms of disrupting um, transportation and supply chains. And even electricity is going to be disrupted by the big storms that we will uh, continue to experience going forward. So that might be a bit of an overview of general climate impacts. And I'll hand it over to my panelists. Yeah, um, I, you know, I'm concerned about transportation in and out of the region um, for people coming. I mean, we're one of the largest tourism destinations in Canada. Um, certainly, you know, we're seeing more flight delays. Um, we also, you know, a big part of the draw to the area is thanks to people like Gabe who have these beautiful vineyards and wineries that people like to visit because of the size of groups. We're often outside in tents. Um, those extreme weather events are certainly affecting that. And, you know, the other thing that's really kind of starting to, to happen is there's a shift in, in the mentality. It used to be, please come visit our destination because we want your tourism dollars. But we are seeing in tourism destinations like Venice, where you know the power shift is really are we supporting properly the people who live in that destination or are we coming in and creating a problem so those visitors coming into events are they creating you know food waste and and plastic waste and you know cluttering our, our roads and i think that you know as we look at long term planning we need to look at those things we desperately need better infrastructure on public transportation, whether that's rail or go train. Um, you know, I know that we're making baby steps, but when you compare us to Quebec or Europe, um, we're really lagging behind. And I think that we have a real opportunity there. Um, and I think, you know, the way that we are built primarily as a an agricultural destination that grew into a tourism destination, um, I think that we're going to start to see some squeeze on on transportation. You know, our roads are getting clogged and, um, you know, I also am concerned and I'd like, you know, to hand this over to Gabe, but about the long term viability of these weather changes on our ability to grow the crops that draw people to our to our area. Yeah, I can, you know, it's an interesting uh, conversation because everything you guys have said are like, are, you know, kind of sum up obviously what I'm going to say, grow grapes for a living. Um, and, and I mean, I think what is misunderstood about the Niagara region is that it's not just um, a place where we grow grapes, it's just a global unique mesoclimate like that is, uh, that is very special in nature but between the lake, the escarpment, it creates the, the, the climate moderation for wine grapes, for peaches, plums, nectarines. It is a bread 
a bread belt or bread, what do you call it? A banana belt or banana, bread basket for uh, Ontario and for the country. Um, yeah, and, and the extreme weather patterns are felt. It's, it's a definite concern. We had the, the wettest uh, harvest window in four decades, the last harvest. People lost like entire fields of grapes to disease and fungal pressures. Um, we've had severe winter snaps. Um, and, and those, those patterns, you know, are affected from, um, you know, we think of, we think of ourselves in this little bubble, but our, our precipitation patterns come from the Gulf stream or, um, the, the polar vortex, uh, which is caused by warming at the, at the poles pushes down, uh, wind currents below our protecting me mechanism, which is lake and escarpment. So we're getting cold winds coming from the south rather than from the north and the east or the north and the west, where we get the lake hitting the escarpment wall, which creates that moderating effect. Um, yeah, so it, it's a, it's a real thing. Uh, we're in, we are, I'm scared of it, I, I guess at the end of the day, but it is also agriculture. So I try to put it into perspective. I don't know if I've met a farmer who is uh, 80, uh, 30, 40, like who hasn't, who has had a, a normal vintage. If you can even, no one even knows what that is. Like it is agriculture. So there is an unpredictability to it. There's no utopian paradise. Um, if you don't uh, manage your, your fruit properly, it will rot. Uh, whether climate change is here or not, but what climate change is doing is, um, is like as Jessica mentioned, is creating extremes on a regular basis. Whether you would be one in ten or one in fifteen, they're now one in five, uh, and that's uh, that becomes a big problem. And and sustainability is you know people, planet, and also profit, and it affects profitability uh, of businesses, uh, and then people tend to panic in those scenarios, and rather than, uh, you know using eco tools at four times the cost or having a, a viable business, people in, in this current moment anyway, when the tools are limited, may like default to something that is less environmentally friendly because they don't have a choice. Um, and they have, you know, so, um, so it's real. It's, I mean, I, I, it, we, it's real and it's, it's affecting agriculture for sure. So I can go in on other points if you'd like, but I don't want to also take up the entire microphone, so. Oh no, this is great. Yeah, Michaela. Yeah, uh, though I'm not in Niagara anymore, I do remember um, going to seeing the tourism that would come in, especially around the wineries. And Gabe, as you mentioned, this is going to, or as everyone's mentioned, this is going to affect the wineries and our growing seasons and our crops, which is also possibly going to have a trickling down effect towards other Niagara businesses. Because part of the things that draw people into Niagara is the wineries and going to the vineyards. So People are staying in hotels, they're going to different restaurants, they're taking these extended vacations that might not happen if we don't have the wineries and the crops and everything bringing people in. So it just shows you that it is like a trickling effect and that we need to be cautious about the environment and making sure that we are aware about this as well, so. And that, that point on awareness, whether intentional or not, Michaela was perfect because um, our next question is actually about communication. And so how do businesses and organizations, how can they communicate about climate change effectively? I wanna jump into that because it's something I'm kind of passionate about. Um, first of all, I think that too many businesses are trying to do too much. They're over-promising and under-delivering. And in my world, we call that selling the dream and servicing the nightmare. They're kind of setting themselves up for failure. And I think what we need to do is draw, you know, pull back and rely on the science a little bit more. And at TSCF or the Sustainable Events Forum, we talk about right action instead of nice action. So, you know, we all got our pin feathers ruffled about straws, but giving up plastic straws is not going to stop the polar ice caps from melting. Addressing your food waste is absolutely going to help. I mean, it's defined as the number one issue by drawdown.org. And yet if we were to survey all of the businesses in Niagara, very few of them are addressing food waste. It's not a sexy topic. It's not something that you can bring front and center like the plastic straws. But I think for your business, you know, you need to go back and say, first, you do an assessment where are my largest emissions? How does that fit into my business model? And what can I do that actually makes a difference, whether it's transportation or you know, food waste or land production, however 
you know, that that sits. And I think we need to feel more comfortable about saying no to the Instagram friendly, you know, save the whales that it really in in reality climate action and your climate budget look just like your 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 finances it's just like your financial budget and it's going to be a lot more spreadsheets than it is instagrams and when it comes to communicating we know um the climate narrative initiative has some fantastic data on where people sit so for canadians 25% of Canadians are very invested and extremely active on the environment. 45% we call the middle and middle. So they, they are interested or keen, but they don't actually know what to do. And they are really, as businesses, they're our prime opportunity to sell our climate initiatives too. The 30% sitting on the other side are either so overwhelmed or so disengaged that we're not going to be able to communicate to them. And every business person knows that there's a certain subset of an audience that just isn't going to resonate with your message. So concentrate on the 70% that would resonate with that message and then speak to them. Again, the science and the research shows, speak to them very simply. Um, you don't need to talk about emissions. You can talk about the good that you're doing in other ways, but keep it very simple. Um, Canadians in particular are resonating with messages about fairness. Um, they do not seem to resonate with economic arguments unless those economic arguments are tied to a value system. So we're charging you X dollars more so that we can use an aluminum a water bottle versus a plastic water bottle. Here's why it's good for you. Um, and again, I would just say, do your homework. Um, drawdown.org is, you know, fantastic. They really collate a lot of research and can direct you towards areas that will have high impact. And then the Climate Narrative Initiative is great for learning how to craft your message so that it resonates with the people that you're directing it to. So that's my perspective. Thanks very much. Um, Thanks, Nelly. I might jump in on that. As a, I'm also in my other uh, another hat I wear is I'm an ocean scientist. So let me jump on the plastic straws in a turtle's nose and save the whales. Absolutely, I love that your point, um, which is so important, is our our audiences are quite savvy these days, and tokenism is very transparent. So not jumping onto a communication platform if you actually don't have a plan then probably not communicating about it is very important. So I would say like the first thing is definitely uh, businesses need to have a plan before they can try and communicate it effectively or our audiences see right through them. You know, we, we, we're, we're well informed. We can sort of sniff that out. Um, and having a plan does take a lot of time and resources. So you made me laugh, Natalie, and maybe a takeaway is going to be it's not Instagram, it's spreadsheets. That's like not a, a slogan that anybody can buy, but that's the, the reality of it. And it does take time. So you have to allocate time and resources to develop a sound plan. And a sound plan is evidence based. But I love some of your points as well that there are a lot of freely available data these days. Um, a really great resource that we used in some of my um, local work is climatedata.ca. And it's got um, downloadable data for every municipality in the region, some even smaller scales than that. And you can get um, current data and then data into the future about what temperature looks like, what maximum rainfall looks like, what highs and lows. So there, there are resources to help develop a sound evidence-based plan. But then I guess the other point I'd like to make, which is the polar opposite, is that talking about climate is super important. And I think we need to normalize conversations about climate change so that they are comfortable, so that they're non-threatening, so that they're not politicized, but they're just part of our daily conversations um, because ultimately that is important. It is a massive issue that collectively we are all going to have to engage in and making that okay to talk about is important. So. Those are my two sort of conflicting points. Don't talk about it too much if you don't have a sound plan, but also let's have conversations that are familiar and friendly and, um, you know, collegial. Yeah. I Just before Jessica, is, or sorry, just before Gabe jumps in there, I, 
when you communicate about it, what I'm finding is that's how you can avoid greenwashing, right? So if someone showed up in Niagara and I handed them a glass of red wine and said, enjoy your Chardonnay, they would look at me and say, lady, you don't know your product that you're selling or that you're servicing. It's just like when, you know, that balloon vendor tries to convince me about the, you know, biodegradable balloon that she's selling me she hasn't done her homework and so it you know Jessica's point about that is is very key that if you don't understand what you're trying to sell it's better to to stay mum but we're at the point where everybody needs to understand what they're selling I, I think those I mean I don't have much more to add to be honest you guys said as much as um, I agree completely with you uh, at these conversations um, are starting um and they have to be they are you know they have to be had even we have a lot of greenwashing in our industry and and i, I do the um the hard worker that is actually trying to build a culture that is truly sustainable it gets annoyed i'm annoyed by it but i'm also happy that these these conversations are even happening maybe they're a little bit greenwashed sometimes because it's the start of a, the real conversation uh you know my son is four and by the time he's 34, he'll be like, he will not have a, a year in his life where climate change isn't a priority. So you're gonna have like a, so unfortunately I think that's how long it's gonna take. If you think about it, you have the baby boomers who it just became part of their life conversation uh, in, the, in their older years. And you have, uh, you have my generation who became the middle years and you have my kid who knows no difference. So we have to have these conversations now, build on them, ingrain them in culture and and the change is going to happen uh, but you know, gre minimizing greenwashing of course yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i agree with all of the points that have been said so far and I, as much as the straw in the in the turtle's nose it's 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 sad and unfortunate and it's not the most um important thing it can be greenwashing it starts conversations i'll have my grandparents talking to me about this and i'll be like okay, but we can move this conversation into something else, something more productive. Um, but it's not the best, but at least it's some, we're talking and we're starting to have conversations about it. And also towards the idea of uh, making a plan and communicating that. At Equovatus, we assess companies based on the plan, do, check, uh, act model. So we see that commitments, or we see that businesses have commitments in place, the actions that they're implement implementing in order to reach these, and then also communicating and checking on their results. So all of having each one of these steps is a way to progress into an effective communication strategy, as has been talked about before. And being able to back that up, of course, is going to help uh, eliminate greenwashing and companies are going to be more strategic with their planning. I didn't take the four of you as people who didn't like turtles before we started this. I'm sh in a state of shock. I, no, I'm, I'm kidding. We yeah, love I think the turtles. We love the turtles. How did we all yeah. turn on turtles? You know, <laughs> and have you seen there was an award-winning photo of the year, which is a little seahorse and its tail is wrapped around a plastic Q-tip. It's just, yeah. and I get so angry because clearly that sucks. But I love your point, Michaela, that that can be a conversation starter. And if everyone's upset about the turtles, then that's a good entry point. Exactly. It, it, it's true. We have to start the conversation somewhere. But I think we also need to pull it back and say, you know, right now, climate people are talking about 50, 50, 50. And that is we have a 50% chance of surviving the climate emergency if we reduce our emissions by 50% by 2030, which is in eight years, and a further 50% by 2050. That's an overall 82% reduction in order for us to have a livable planet. So collectively, as a human race, we're not reducing our emissions, we are increasing them. And earlier today, we talked about um, change. Well, change when you institute it is discipline. Change when somebody else institutes it is a whole different story. But Gabe, I'll throw to you. No, it's, I mean, what you say is so true. I, and it gets me so excited and also fired up because um, it's, it's so difficult to change a moving, like this kinetic energy moving in a direction and there's so much money behind it and political will in developing economies who want to be where the West is 
and and they how we got there by burning a bunch of fossil fuels and so they're going to do the same thing and technology isn't cheap to do it another way and so how do you create a dynamic conversation globally and get political will and money to move and i think we're, i actually see, you can see it coming to fruition i see it in agriculture the amount of technology that is just on the doorstep of being ready is just mind-blowing i just i'm like i'm salivating like come on like you know i'm, I'm working with uh, like two different ai firms for like green tech and there's all these machines that are like uh, tractor implements that reduce and eco-friendly sprays that are actually eco-friendly and actually effective but they're like they're just like it's all just about there you know and um and so like you know we have eight years to you know is it going to happen in, in eight years like i can I, you know i'd love to say yes but real realistically if you look at the numbers no no way like well, um, we, we don't have a choice though, right? Like yeah, it's we don't have a choice, but so, again, like try to stop the kinetic engine that is the global economy well, uh, and, and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, you know, but I think we have to stop creating problems that we then have to solve, right? There's so many things that we do. And, you know, in, in my intro on the, on the thing, I Todd, I noticed your marketing people were, were, were um, I poke fun at myself. They call me the toilet paper queen because something as simple as every day in Canada, 27,000 trees, and this is old data, so it's probably more at this point, but 27,000 trees are felled to make premium toilet paper because people don't buy recycled toilet paper. Now, how easy is it to buy recycled toilet paper? In Canada, not that easy. We don't have the infrastructure, but it's a great business opportunity. So if somebody out there has a paper manufacturing plan, we need recycled toilet paper. So by chopping down all of these trees, we are actually destroying the part of the planet that is fixing this problem. So you know, we need to stop doing that. Every time we take food waste, in Canada, 58% of our food is wasted. Of that, they say 66% of that 58% is actually recoverable. Right now, for all of the hotels and the restaurants in Niagara, revenue flow goes, um, so food revenue coming in, 5% of it goes towards profit, 7% goes to waste. So if we could take food waste, and shift it into the profit column, you have a potential 12%. Maybe that's unrealistic. Maybe you have a potential 10%. But I think, that, you know, Gabe, those are opportunities that we do have now while we're waiting for some of this technology to, to come through. Sorry, I get a little passionate about the toilet paper. No, it's, I mean, it's great. You have to. I, this is it. Like, um, we all fight within our industries for these advancements, right? Like, you know, I, um, and, and, um, but the, like the, unfortunately, the reality of, of like the pace of movement of tech and flow of cash and economics and, and changing of cultural habits. Um, it, I mean, and I know I'm not trying to be the pessimist or the, or the, the pessimist on the panel because I'm, I'm, I agree fully with you. So this is a tough to be debating you even about this topic. But um, is like in, in my experience is is like the pace of cultural change is slow and meets resistance and. Um, and and especially as for, for fortunate in Canada to have a very stable conversation politically on all sides of the aisle, and that's we're like in that, but that is a minority position to be in currently, um, and so that doesn't doesn't make it easier to have these goals be reached. Um, so it's it's it makes me nervous, but then I see all these technologies coming to the table, so then I may get excited again. Uh, and and it's not just robots uh, for the people who are anti-robots. Not just robots. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also got a young son and I tease that he already trusts the robots more than me because he asked me to turn on the GPS because he's like the lady knows better than you and I think <laughs> this is the beginning of the robot revolution but let me to your point Gabe I love well both of you I love this conversation about there is momentum building in every sector in everyone's you know little tiny sphere of the world and although like clearly what we're dealing with is a, the, like arguably the global crisis that we have to tackle. I'm not underplaying the challenges, but I think that a lot of social theory points to how change feels slow because momentum builds without a lot of visible change on the surface. But that momentum that is building is creating a platform for a rapid transition. And so if I can t like spin your 
pessimism in, in sort of an optimistic lens, there's a lot of historical examples that show there's all this movement and there's all these things happening that are sort of laying the groundwork and then it just takes a spark. And, and you know, this has been said a lot of times in the last couple of years, but I think COVID is a really um, positive example of how rapidly we can change if this incentive is there. And so I suspect, you know, it's going to be large climactic disaster events that are going to tip us to the threshold turning point, which, uh, you know, ideally we'd like to avoid. We don't want any loss of life. We don't want any human suffering, but we see these events. And I think the combination of all of these sectors building, I love hearing you guys talk about what's happening in your fields and then combined with big, you know, climactic events might just be the, the tipping point that we need to catalyze movement in these like huge systems of inertia. Um, yeah. Jessica, you bring up something really interesting. So I'm often, you know, pulled in to, to ask to speak about, you know, what we're doing in events and we're way behind in, in the event industry, right? We have a long, long way to go. But what I see is that I couldn't tell a lawyer how to make his, his or her office green. I couldn't tell an engineer, or I, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't try to do that with any of you. But you're right, if each of us sort of take a piece of it, and what I'm, I, what I'm getting pessimistic about is the number of people that feel climate shame, and so they don't even want to try, right? And, and they don't want to take leadership. And again, I go back to that thing that, you know, we're going to hit a point when Gabe and your son, your, your children are, you know, elderly, we're going to be elderly and they're going to be taking care of us in our old age. And they're going to be like, you really should have done something while you could have. And that haunts me, you know, um, we, you know, we are, we carry a big responsibility to take some action. Now we created this mess, we better clean it up. Otherwise we are not going to have a good time in the old age home. Can I jump in on that, Natalie, because that resonates so much with me and my students and all of us are feeling this climate shame, but I like to push back against that. And some theorists are calling that the third wave of climate denial. They're saying that the first wave was climate change is not happening. And then the second wave was, okay, it is happening, but it's not human caused. And then the third wave is, okay, it is happening and it is humans and it's your fault. And there's a lot of really, uh, a lot of money, a lot of like good marketing and PR that goes into framing it now as sort of our fault so that we feel shame and that shame sort of discourages us from acting. So I think it's important that we push back against that and not let them, them, you know, whether it's big oil or whoever it is, shame us into inaction. So I think we should be inspired by what each of us are doing and, and recognize it as a really important contribution that collectively is shifting the dial uh, you know, hopefully rapidly. And to jump on that, I remember being in um, Jessica's class talking about, uh, we would come in on Monday morning and we'd be talking about all of the different things that were going on in the world, whether it, usually it's negative and we would have this, I guess it's almost eco anxiety. We were talking about all these topics and you would bring it back and be like, look at all the things we have accomplished as a society and also moving away from that shame. And that was one of the biggest things I think I learned from, or not the biggest, but one of the things that stuck with me. But also we see that with organizations of businesses. They're like, well, there's so many things. How do we start? Where are we starting? Is it even worth it? Yes, it's worth it, um, of course. But to bring that back and they're just, it's so overwhelming. You need to look at your industry. You look at, need to look at your impact. What is relevant for your sector? And if let's say you're not at a great starting point or you don't know where to start, that's completely okay to recognize and acknowledge it, but let's develop a plan. This is how we move forward and this is how we're going to make impactful changes within the climate. It, it's a fine line, right? We don't wanna be greenwashed. Um, so we're tempted to push back when people feed to us sort of mediocre or, or not ideal priority prioritize priorities that they've put into their business and I know the hotel industry is sort of rife with that right it's like you can um, not wash your sheets and save the planet right well it's not quite gonna happen but we need to encourage but then ask for more right it, you know in and I was told early when I started this journey that we needed um, that 
Greta Thunberg was not going to save the world. There needed to be a million Gretas. And so when we started TSEF, my thought was, instead of demoralizing me, I just thought I need to find 999,999 more Gretas. And I think I'm at about 999,000 even now. We might have found 1,000. But you know, it will take leadership in many, many places. So as business people, we are leaders, right? As an entrepreneur, what gets me up in the morning is finding a problem that needs to be solved. This is a huge problem. And I, Michaela can probably relate to that. If you have anything to do with climate action right now, you are a hot commodity in the job market. And you know, we see these changes coming. The insurance companies saw these changes coming years ago. And we're starting to see issues like supply chain disruption and increased costs which are affecting our businesses. So it really is a business problem that we can work on to solve. When you're definitely, oh, sorry, Michaela, go ahead. No, just adding on to that, I've definitely seen a change from the job market when I entered in 2019, being in that business sustainability. I guess at the time it was like a niche and trying to find a job with that combined the two. Now it is, there's so many different opportunities in whatever area of business you are in. It's, it's incredible. And it's nice to see that change, but, and I very quickly changed over the past three years too. So. Well, it's exciting to think, I mean, if you think about it dynamically, if we're going to shift to a green economy that includes not just uh, fossil fuels, it includes the way we produce and consume uh, our, our, the way, what we eat, how we produce what we eat, so now we have to transition those sectors of the economy, which in say the dairy industry in Quebec is a massive part of their economy. We have to transition that sector of the economy. We have to contract that section of the economy, replace those jobs, retrain those people, grow the culture and have that so the people, political politicians don't lose their jobs. And you have to do that across every sector across the country. It is a dynamic conversation. It's not easy, but we're having it. Like it's, it's not going anywhere. You have like, uh, you have two leaders, uh, like our leader and the American leader, like not building pipelines because the political pressure is too great right. for them to build pipelines. So, I mean, that's going to force downward pressure on the oil and gas sector to start evolving. And people are, you know, maybe young people won't go to that sector anymore. They'll look for other jobs. And, and it, it's a dynamic conversation with these, so many moving parts. It's parts that we don't even think about, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, so and, and it scares people like what do you mean you're gonna have to shrink an industry not grow an industry it's like built into our ethos that we always are growing and getting richer and getting bigger no actually this sector is gonna have to shrink but this one's gonna explode like 400 times yeah. and, and it requires very good communication by uh, from government and from educators that uh, to not be scared in, in educating young people you know maybe you know, your dad did this, but, you know, you should do this, you know, and, and, and that's mm -hmm. going to happen very quickly. But I think you're right. That whole point about the groundswell, it's, mm -hmm. it's there, like it's not going anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, and so it's going to happen and it's going to be, but I just, from, uh, I just don't think it's going to happen in, in like five to eight years, unfortunately. That's just, again, this is from a practical point of view, uh, which just scares the crap out of me. Uh, and it makes me very angry, I guess, if I can use that word, cause I'm not an angry person, but that, that, we got to this point uh, that where we're talking about these deadlines that are that are insane, and and uh, and no one did anything sooner because everyone wanted to make profit. It's frustrating. I, I understand, yeah, I understand your pessimism, um, Gabriel. It, it's you know I'm I'm more hopeful than that because I am seeing huge shifts in behavior change, and I speak to that as someone who was in the event industry had never done a virtual event three years ago. Now I'm virtually a TV producer. You know, it, it just, that shift happened very quickly. Interestingly enough, what I found happened in our industry, it was the business people. So those of us who owned our own businesses, we knew we had to change our business model, right? The context had changed. So Todd, when you talk about how do we change that business model? Well, you know, this was what was presented to us and now we've had to to flip. And I did just want to give a shout out to um, the University of Ottawa partnered with a vodka company in um, uh, just outside of Ottawa and they created a process by which they actually take milk waste, which I didn't realize was practically radioactive, and they make vodka out of it. So it's called Vodkao. 
And I think Todd, if you've been to some of our events, we usually drink it at our at our events. So it kind of speaks to Gabriel's point that there's all of this technology that's being developed and that we can find them and we can support them. Um, but those industries were changing anyways, right? Our, our new, um, U, what is it, USMCA agreement, as of now, American milk is allowed into Canada. So that milk industry was going to be affected anyways. And I think sometimes people need to understand that we do live in a business context where there is rapid change. And what's that thing about the only thing that's constant is change. So we should embrace it and we should create the change, not be pushed around by it. Well, there is a plant-based burger at Kentucky Fried Chicken, so maybe there's hope. So maybe there's hope. It is, um, when you, just when you were talking about um, shaming, I, I think I see it even it happens to employees as well. So it, it's, when we're talking about communication, it's not just having an Instagram post as we talked about with um, what was it like? I think it was A&W had a whole bunch of orange straws in a sort of like abstract art in, installation in Toronto to say we're done with the orange straws and it was probably had lots of hearts and emojis and excitement um, but then employees get yelled at when new environmental initiatives get introduced. Um, I was living in Vancouver when shoppers started charging for their bags and I remember the frontline staff getting yelled at and screamed at and over five cents right and so it, yeah some organizations i think have to communicate really well internally and get buy-in and explain why um because it the other thing i was thinking about with shame even just us having this kind of panel discussion <laughs> there will be people who who will say uh-huh sure or next or you know I hate the words of woke and virtual or virtue signaling and and things like that but as someone who researches corporate social responsibility there's a lot of people who don't believe there are any socially responsible businesses and have a lot of pessimism with terms like that or with terms like sustainability and so you know how it's framed whether it's a carrot or a stick approach or concrete versus abstract when you're presenting information to a, or is it um you know make the benefit about the consumer or do you make it about society in general or, and, and any combination of those factors have been shown to influence um, communication well um, but yeah I'd, I'd, I'd love to see better internal communication as well because I think having ambassadors within your organization can be hugely important as well that's one point you know it's yeah. a great point sorry Jessica you go ahead Oh, thanks. I'll just be quick. I was just going to say, um, I, I've been I've been teaching and giving public talks in uh, about climate change for more than ten years now, and I've noticed a real shift in my audience responses. Where I used to get yelled at by deniers, who are essentially absent now, and instead, what I get is people who are so angry at the inaction. And so I've noticed a shift in public responses to my public talks, which is great. I, I love get, I love getting yelled at about not enough action, which to me is reflective of you know this societal push. And and to the the point Todd about employees getting yelled at when we're not offering plastic bags anymore, maybe there are lessons to be learned about respect and need for frontline workers coming out of COVID that we didn't have previously. And maybe those are windows of opportunities to understand how critical and essential frontline workers are and to show them respect. Clearly that's not always the case. Uh, you know, it, we've had challenges with different protocols in the last few years, but um, yeah, I'd like to say, I'd like to think that people, public opinion can shift. And I do think that I've seen that in public responses to climate talks. And maybe there is now around accepting change in a way that maybe we weren't open to uh, two years ago. Yeah, over to you, yeah. Natalie. Yeah, I, I think we've seen a bit of a disintegration of the social contract, right? Um, and, you know, we've all been with someone who treated the wait staff poorly, right? I mean, none of us would ever do that. But, you know, it, it starts to you know, really diverge. And I don't know that that's really a climate related thing. I mean, we hear horror stories about planes in the US and, you know, even some Canadian planes where, you know, everybody's getting arrested at the other end. So I think that that disintegration of that social contract is, is part of it. 
what I see is that people are really looking for community and not always in the best way. And so as climate activism, if we can start to create that community and allow people to feel engaged with whatever action we're taking, you'll find that that starts to resonate. And, you know, if, if I believe myself to be a very climate aware person, well, naturally I'm going to gravitate towards Cave Springs, right? And I wanna feel engaged and I wanna feel like buying their wines is helping my cause. Now that's 70% of Canadians. And, you know, Todd, you said something really interesting that sort of resonated with me. I've been um, giving webinars to the Hotel Association of Canada. And one of the things that I'm asking the hotels to do is stop having me book an event in Edmonton and talk to the sustainability person 3,000 kilometers away in Toronto, because there's this huge disconnect. When I arrive at the hotel, nobody on site speaks the language that I've been dealing with. So it really needs to come down to frontline um, awareness and education. We, I, I understand the need to have a climate person at your company, but everyone should understand the basics and be able to communicate. And Mikhail, I'd be interested to know how much of your work centers around helping sort of integrate throughout the company that awareness. And, and Gabriel, you probably have the exact same thing, right? Could I talk to you know, someone in the wine shop and have them explain your sustainability plan? Probably yes. Well, if I could, so it, it, I think those are great points. And, and I think that what Jessica resonated with me is like 10 years ago, um, you had people yelling at you five years ago when I proposed these or six years ago, when I pro proposed some pretty dramatic shifts in our viticultural approach. I got a lot of pushback and you slowly you change culture, you change the conversation, you validate process. Uh, science takes time. And, and then now, you know, 10 years now, no one is in the room yelling at you six years. Now I got my team bringing me ideas. Um, you know, and 10 years from now, we're going to have like a dramatic reduction in, uh, in our overuse of fossil fuels. And I, I don't like, and this is, I got to say this, and this is, again, I'm not a pessimist. I, I really, I hope it doesn't come across that way. I just, um, is that like oil and gas, like petroleum products, like in specific, uh, applications have advanced our medical technologies in a way that is unprecedented and uh, we can't do without. So it's not about like like we're not the people working on gas aren't demons or we've just overused it to the point where we it is in gross excess and and we need to scale that back to what we need and no more and 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 that is going to be difficult but we're doing it like there's no choice right and so but you know 10 years to get no angry people 10 more years to get and then you know you do like you know you see what you see it happening so quickly and i'm not pessimistic i'm, I'm actually the dramatic shift that is happening in, happening in a single generation is, is insane. The cultural shifting, the changing of our economic engines, like those things to happen in a single generation, when for the last year we've just been like full throttle on oil and gas is, is insane. And in 20, 30 years to have that shift, that dramatic shift uh, is exciting. It's so- I like exciting. everything you said, except your timeline. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I agree. I, I don't like my timeline either. <laughs> But it's happening. I mean, it's, it's happening. It's not, it's not going away. It's only getting stronger. And I think we'll pick up pace. So maybe I am wrong, and I hope I am, because I hope the pace picks up uh, and, and we do hit our goals because I fear for my beautiful young son. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Well, you know what? We'll have a beer, um, whoever, whoever wins. I'm hoping I'll win that. I, I, I hope so, too. <laughs> yeah, I'd gladly buy you a beer if I win that one. <laughs> Um, and just to touch on your point, Natalie, how you talked about uh, having it integrated throughout a company and seeing, uh, does everyone within your company know the sustainability aspects that you're working towards? I think for companies that integrate their sustainable business, uh, their sustainable management systems throughout their organization, people are aware because it touches on every aspect of a business. If you are having a sustainable management system in place, it should touch on your HR team. It should start touch on your sustainable procurement team, your marketing. So successful um, sustainability management programs and companies that are achieving this, through even your sales organized, like every single aspect of the business should have an idea of this. It depends on how companies are integrating it and what steps they're doing to take that. I did want to mention we have about um, five minutes before we go to Q&A. So what I'd 
I'd love to touch on is um, if there is someone in the community who's a small business owner, they might have the sense that they're tiny, that their footprint's not very big, that or going the other way, that their efficacy is not really, it, that they're not big enough to make a difference. So, I mean, we see it with donating blood and we see it with voting and, well, if I donate $2, it's not really gonna make a difference or my vote's a wasted vote. So I, th I think sometimes small businesses feel a, their impact is is sort of negligent or is is next to nothing going in in both directions so i did want to speak to the small business sector and say okay what does this mean for them specifically because i think oftentimes i'm probably guilty of it you know we, we say like big in front of everything right like big oil big pharma big this mining huge mining operations there obviously isn't small craft artisanal oil right so it's not um or like tiny pharma is, is so nice or right so i did want to talk about the the small business element to this discussion as well yeah and as a small business owner i want to i want to jump on that um you know zero waste chef who is on actually on instagram um talked about you know if the five of us went zero waste tomorrow we would affect nothing but if we got hundreds of small businesses to take a small step, it starts to hit that tipping point that Gabriel's talking about where we start to see institutional change, infrastructure, contextual change. And so that's really where, you know, I think the power of the business community is really important. I mean, for sure, I am gonna be reaching out to Gabriel after this because I was not as aware of what they're doing we hold lots of events at Cave Springs. There's some opportunity to collaborate and to build on that. And so what we know is if you are currently doing nothing and you move to doing something, it's the law of diminishing returns, right? So the person who is doing nothing, who starts something is actually having the greatest effect. So that's where we need to start. I keep telling the hotel um, people, don't worry about going from four green keys to five green keys. Go from zero keys to one, and you will start your journey. But you got to start. You have to start. It's a great point. You have to start. Yeah, I jump in with one of my favorite climate quotes. Who I have, no, I have had several people tell me it wasn't them. So I don't know who to attribute this to, but it's exactly what you said, Nelly. But I, and and Michaela, I love your comment about our classes. I get so many students who are so discouraged at, at just feeling the weight of it and feeling like they're too small to make a difference. And the quote is. Climate action happens not when a handful of people do it perfectly, but when a millions of us do the best we can. And so it's the same point that you've made. And it matters. I love what you said, Michaela, like, yes, it's worth it. I think that's a great sort of, um, you know, point to, to end on for me. And bringing it back to that as well, as I was one person in your class, and now I work with a thousand people that are like-minded individuals as myself. And that is one of the most wonderful things to go from my education to my uh, career and feel like I am making an impact, even if as a sustainability analyst, an entry level sustainability analyst, I still feel like I'm making a difference. And at EcoVadis, 70% of the companies we do access are small and medium sized businesses. So we are seeing these companies make changes towards sustainability. And I think the discouraging thing for small sized businesses and medium sized businesses is they're comparing themselves to large companies. And that's not fair. You can't compare yourself to a company that has plenty of resources, plenty of people um, and money to put behind it. But you can adapt your sustainability approach and how you're going to address climate change depending on your size. So if you're looking at your sustainable procurement, maybe a large size company is going to have capacity building for their suppliers, but what can you do as a small size company? You could still conduct a CSR analysis within your supply chain and look at it on a smaller scale. So your actions, of course, are still gonna have an impact. It's just tailoring them to your company and your resources, so. Yeah, yeah. it's a bit, of, sorry, Gabe, go ahead. Oh. No, Todd, I think you were just gonna say something. Oh. 
Yeah, I've, I've done a little bit of research comparing small and large organizations and in terms of being engaged in CSR. And big businesses were actually starting at a sort of a deficit or a liability because they're big. And then small businesses had this small boost of assuming that if you're a small business, that you're a nice person <laughs> to begin with, or that you would engage in CSR for the right reasons. And big businesses would only do it to just sort of quiet their critics or, and, and but among the interviews that I did, um, there was a lot of small businesses that were being cited as examples of socially responsible organizations. And they looked at even being small as being socially responsible, which in a way is kind of interesting because you could be a small business and also be absolutely horrible <laughs> as an employer or really bad environmentally. But just that immediately when you attach small and, and when you add local as well, um, another terminology that people tend to like and support, um, it's interesting that you're already starting with a boost. And then the large businesses, they had to say, well, we're gonna do this for the next seven years and we're going to commit to it. And this is how much money we're gonna put up. But the small businesses, it was just like, do little things. Just, you know, even if um, I actually have a, well, it's not, a, not published yet, but I had a paper that suggested that if you are socially responsible, but you're motivated for egoistic reasons and you're small, it actually worked out better than doing it for sort of philanthropic reasons because people want small businesses to succeed and mm -hmm. to do well. And I, I feel like not being overwhelmed and saying, yeah, okay, we're going to take the, the next step or we're going to start measuring this or we're going to start taking a step back and look at our, our business plan um, could be really helpful because I, I believe it's probably even higher in Niagara, but it's over 90% in, in Canada. All businesses are SMEs, probably 95, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Even, you know. Yeah, we use a weird um, measurement in Canada, though it's not based on revenue like it is in so many other jurisdictions. We go based on the number of employees. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a bit of a misnomer, but, you know, strictly speaking from a business perspective, if you become environmentally aware, you become a climate conscious business, you're embracing what we would call blue ocean strategy, right? There's not a lot of you, people are looking for you, and you stand out as having something unique. That's right now. In four years, Gabriel says 10, but I'm going to go with four. Um, in four years, you're going to stick out if you're not environmentally conscious. So, you know, again, it's you're either going to have this change thrust upon you through consumer demand or regulation, or you're going to start now and you're going to make the change slowly and willingly. And I'd go for slow and willing versus regulation. I would, yeah, if I could throw in uh, as a small business uh, employee, like Cave Spring is a small, uh, medium family run business, viable business. Um, uh, and we are, we have federal development grants, provincial partnerships with the provincial government, cross border relationships with universities and states, provincial relationships with universities here, collaborations across provincial lines. And those just come from making phone calls and talking to people and, and all of those, like, um, and 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 not ringing doorbells, uh, and and that's it, it, I'm not exaggerating how simple this happened, uh, and and with an idea and open to having a conversation, and it's led to all those things, and and we are just one small business, so um, it's not only possible, um, it's out there waiting for you to to make just research who the scientist is or who the business is, and and then make the call, and it, they just the, the, you'll be too busy very quickly. <laughs> No. Can, can I jump in on that? That's a, I love that. And I was going to say, you've got friends in Niagara and Brock is one. And um, as a tangible example, every winter I run a graduate class on climate adaptation. And through a series of 12 weeks, we develop mock climate adaptation plans. And we are looking for people that we can do that for. And so there are lots of, um, yeah, I love your, your comment about partnerships. There's lots of partners and um, please get in touch if you would like students to engage with you on some climate adaptation action. Um, yeah. Yeah, and Todd, your class actually did a marketing plan for TSCF, which we actioned immediately. It was very helpful. Yeah, I, I think the partnerships can happen if I can give a quick plug for our experiential learning elements at Brock, I think it's, I mean, 
it's yes, it's part of our tagline, the idea of experience Brock, but every class I've taught has an experiential element and a local partner, whether they're nonprofit or small business or, or you know, for profit. And I think just combining expertise is really important as well. So um, I, I feel like as I'd like to consider myself a marketing professional <laughs> to a degree, um, not just maybe a, a teacher, but um, I, I, when I'm looking at communication as it relates to the pandemic for the last two years and some of the mistakes and I don't know, like some miscommunication as well, it's, it's, and then a lot of businesses sort of felt like we have to say something, but they said things that were really, really empty and just, we're here for you, but we're not actually going to do anything, but don't worry, we're here for you. And so I, I feel like the, the emptiness needs to be addressed as well. And I think having experts working together will make that communication better because it'll be more informed from scientists to begin with, um, but also, yeah, pairing and, and partnerships. Um, go ahead, Natalie. I had a question. When you use the term emptiness, are you talking about maybe a lack of integrity in the messaging or nothing substantive behind it for action? What 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 were you okay. referencing? Yeah, what I would say is that there's a lot of businesses that wanted to say, we're here for you during these, you know, how many times have we heard unprecedented times and pivot in our, and your safety and abundance of caution and, and so on. But um, they often weren't actually doing anything. And so it felt like they needed needed to say it in their minds, um, but then they weren't really saying anything. And I, I think that also happens as it relates to sustainability initiatives and communications. And I really like, I know I'm, we're kind of cutting into some Q&A. The last thing I'll say is before we go to the audience questions, um, when I lived in the UK, Marks and Spencer used to put out a report, a formalized plan, and they would identify things that they did really well and pat themselves on the back for that. But they also had separate listings of all the things that they did really poorly and that they needed to improve. And I think that balanced approach to it is, yes. is more yes. to your point of like, we're going to steal the Instagram versus spreadsheets point that you made before is saying, well, no, there's things that we need to do better. And admitting that you're not perfect to me feels like it addresses our discussion on greenwashing as well. You know, it is so important, and I'm having such a struggle in our industry with this, is that building consumer trust is crucial. There's a reason why Costco just refunds your stuff. There's a reason why Amazon takes it, you know, L.L. Bean. There is a such an invaluable part to having trust in, in a company or having your, your, your clients or your guests or your customers trust. And one of the things that we tell people is that when you do your climate action plan, just admit that you don't know everything, right? And it, it's, you know, we've all encountered that when someone stumbles and falls, you know, or, or fails to meet a service expectation, an apology is all you need. Hey, sorry, I will do better. When you're confronted with either no communication or excuses, it just frustrates you. And I, it, it shocks me that still today people are, are working through this. I mean, in every business school I know, they teach about the Tylenol issue, right? Tylenol just owned the issue. They dealt with it. How many other companies didn't? And, it, you know, it kind of speaks to that thing is that you are trying to build brand loyalty. Um, if I bought a bottle of Cave Springs wine and it was off, Gabriel would replace it and just say, sorry, you know, it'll never happen. I know, Gabriel, but on the off chance it ever did, <clears throat> because he knows that's how you build that repeat. That's how you build that community of people who love your stuff. So I completely agree. You've got to show that integrity and build brand trust. Awesome. Thank you for agreeing with me. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, we have a few questions that have, have come through, which is obviously an important point of our discussion. So I'm sorry we cut into it. That was for my fault as, as the moderator. Um, some of my students would be able to speak to my um, time management struggles at times as well. Um, anyways, so the, the first question is actually directed to Michaela. So none of us um, are allowed to speak, which is Perfectly fine by me. Um, so Michaela, um, someone in the audience or, or watching at home obviously was in the exact same position that you are um, or were in a couple of years ago at Goodman 
um, but also minoring in, in environmental sustainability. So they are interested in um, the benefits and also um, salary range and and expectations. So one thing I would I would imagine is that it, it sort of happens to nonprofits a lot in working in in social marketing is sort of like well you're doing it because it makes you feel good so you should get paid less even though you're an expert in your area. So I don't know if that's their their specific sure. question, but it, yeah. Yeah, um, I can touch a bit about that. So I graduated in 2019 and I have had three different sustainability jobs since my graduation. Uh, right after school, I was hired uh, where I did my co-op at Bush Systems. Then uh, the pandemic happened and I was laid off where I went to work for a non-for-profit. Um, and then now I'm at Ecovatis. So three very different uh, industries from uh, corporate to non-for-profit and there is a difference in um, pay not to get into details but I think it depends on what you're looking for and I think if you like the work that you're doing for a non-for-profit and you are fulfilled not only financially and um, I think personally with the work that you're doing then it's a great opportunity but there is that combination of business and sustainability that I think is more of where you want to come out or some people would like to come out in after graduation so there definitely are opportunities and there's also opportunities if you're um, you know when you're in the business field I think there can be a wide range of depending if you're going to finance or if you're going into marketing uh, same with the sustainability world so uh, doing that research is definitely optimal and then also if you want to do finance and sustainability, that is an option. If you want to do marketing and sustainability, that is an option now. I think especially in 2022, you are going to have numerous opportunities and your combination of business and sustainability is going to be a selling factor in your interviews. And I think definitely highlighting that because you understand sustainability, but you also know how to communicate and talk to people from a business standpoint and convince people why sustainability is important and put the numbers behind it and the facts that like ESG is going to help your business. Um, I think sometimes people still think it's gonna be a, a detriment, but no, being a uh, sustainable company, having this integrated is going to help overall, whether it's your marketing strategy, your environmental sustainability like risks, like being able to adapt. Um, so that's kind of getting off on the topic, but I think you're coming out at a very good point at graduating now. And I think highlighting that and um, make sure you're positioning yourself in your interviews is going to get the job that you want and also the salary, hopefully, that you want as well. Yeah, I was thinking um, that idea of, well, you'll sleep better at night knowing that you work for a nonprofit, so we're not not going to pay you as well because you're you shouldn't ex I remember one of my friends um he's my PhD supervisor his mom said you shouldn't even get paid when you he, he ran the marketing side of things at the BC Cancer Society and she said you shouldn't even be paid because you're just doing something good like what and I think that happens sometimes unfortunately with nonprofits and and even you know environmentally friendly certification organizations you know you should just be able to ask them for their services for free. And that's one thing that needs to be eliminated. And also looking at it as investing in, in expertise and people in these fields is really, really important as well. So that we should make millionaires and billionaires out of the oil company executives, but the people doing marketing for cancer prevention and sustainability should starve? Yeah, no way. Yeah, and if it sounded, I mean, he, the funny thing is he he did drive a Porsche when he worked in for profit and then when he worked for BC Cancer he sold it and he drove a Subaru that was used and so he didn't want to have a nice car driving to the the BC Cancer lot but yeah it, it's funny how those expectations are placed on on people doing things that related to the environment or being socially responsible or there's always a pushback against things that are sustainable or or eco-friendly costing more as well which is obviously a whole other line of discussion but I should go back to the audience question just so we don't 
alienate too, people, too many people. Um, so one of the questions is related to uh, Greta Thunberg. Um, so when discussing things like um, protests and, and marches and talks that Greta put on, um, the question is whether does that help in making a change or can we individually um, gain power and then bring change? Um, so the, the question is, and until then, do we earn credentials to be validated enough to get things done? So I, I think what they're speaking to is, is how do we as individuals sort of build a grassroots movement versus um, having a high profile multi-million Twitter follower account type type of approach. Right, right. And I, I, I'd like to address that first. Um, Greta Thunberg did what she had to because nobody was listening at the time. So that will resonate with a certain audience, but it will alienate others. So every person has to go forward sort of how they can. Protests are helpful in a certain perspective. I'm not very comfortable at a protest, but I'm very comfortable exercising my buying power as a company and I'm very comfortable talking about individual changes. So you're gonna find your sweet spot. Um, maybe you're the world's greatest sign maker and you're very clever and witty and you have the greatest signs ever. Um, I think Gabe, my sign said, there's no wine on a dead planet, just so you know, at the last, uh, the last March. But that's why we need your voice because you'll resonate with people different. Each one of us on this panel has a very different style. Um, but I do want to quote Paul Coelho, who said, the world is not changed by your opinion, it is changed by your example. So just set an example however you feel. But talking about it isn't going to do it. You're going to have to take some action. Great. I'll, I'll divert back to the other um, stream so I can see the questions, if that's all right. Um, we did somewhat address this, so I hope the person who asked this question is okay. We did talk about balancing public demand between um, environmental sustainability, but also the increasing skepticism of greenwashing. So I think we, we kind of have covered that a little bit. Um, one of the questions I think is, is interesting, and I think it, it often happens, is that anything in CSR or sustainability or addressing climate change is seen as a cost and not an investment. So I think it's a really good question. You know, how do you how do you tell businesses that um, not doing this will have an impact on your bottom line without sort of like screams of you're using guilt and shame and fear appeals to make me feel bad? Because I I think some businesses feel like they are being attacked when they're being asked to make changes or invest in in more environmentally friendly approaches as well. Yeah, that might be, Gabriel, I think you have probably a great perspective on that um, because the things that we talked about as we were warming up were about things that cost money and maybe didn't have the effect that you were looking yeah, for. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting conversation, especially in agriculture. I mean, you think 10 years ago, when the government puts out a document and it tells you how to manage uh, different types of tender fruit, and in there are all the sprays that are legal and regulated and gone through a rigorous regulatory body to be even be approved uh and and all you know 10 years ago like when this conversation had a bunch of you know like had angry people in the classroom yelling at you uh they were just following the rules and now there's now they're being told that the rules they're following are they're bad people for following the rules they're just doing what they were told and following that was in the publication from the government and so it's not only just uh, it's not so now and now now in the last five years we've had like a, just a you know like twenty percent of that list now is all these new eco products and but I've been using this product for you know ten years and and you slowly but surely the, the the old products are getting deregulated and pulled off the list and more eco products are coming on that are they have been proven effective but again you you uh, you risk um, displacing and, and making it getting people defend, defensive and some of these products cost more and people are running tight margins on as, as you know before in this inflationary period uh things were still tight um mm -hmm. and so it comes by having dynamic conversations and, and it takes time and it's not like giving an answer but it is because that's how it's happened at our company and i'm not case spring has always been eco-conscious I, I have to say that because I, I wouldn't have gone there if they were not but uh um 
but to kind of move rapidly with the times and be ahead of the curve rather than following the curve has taken some um, some some good movement on our part, and we're there and and we're having these conversations. Um, so it's but I, back to the point you made there, Natalie. About you need to oh sorry, my hands like very big on that. <laughs> back to the point you make um, is is you need to start by having the conversations and start small, and and what may seem small in year one continued in year two with another step forward continuing year three the next thing you know you've made major change okay. like and it's and it's ha it's happened for us at both in the winery uh and in the vineyard and and it, it was like baby steps and then also those baby steps compiled and compounded and we ended up like dramatically shifting um right. and so um that's that's how i mean but again 10 years ago the conversation this has created an isolate isolation environment and the further we get away from that the easier these conversations are um, yeah so. yeah can i, can I, I jump in on that too yeah. um, and then i have to point out to jessica you bet <laughs> sure um just quickly on when we're talking about climate action there's largely two prongs right there's always mitigation which is reducing greenhouse gas emissions that's largely what we've been talking about but the other side of that coin is climate adaptation and i work in climate adaptation so i know it better uh, and fortunately there's some good numbers coming out now about how um, putting dollars into climate adaptation actions saves money in the relatively short term and mm -hmm. Uh, I've been working mostly in, recently at the municipal scale, and so the Federation of Canadian Municipalities has just come out with a really great report, which shows something to the scale of for every dollar spent on an adaptive action, four dollars are saved in terms of preventing climate catastrophe. And, you know, so that might be this is probably a terrible example game, but like crops that are more resistant to mold, for example, no, or great example. You know, all of those things, we know that climate is having a massive financial impact in terms of the damages that it causes. So I think I won't, I can't speak to the mitigation side as much, but I know from an adaptation point of view, there's absolutely an economic argument to be made about money saved by taking action. Um, yeah, that's all. That's a great point, though, by the way, uh, Jessica, there are like um, varieties of grapes uh, that have been bred to be disease resistant and yeah. uh, and they're gaining popularity faster than they can propagate them. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Well, it speeds back to the point that I made earlier about let's stop solving problems that we're creating. Right. Is that we've got the technology. But I wanted to, you know, first of all, I want to address offsets because a lot of companies right now are are bouncing to offsets as sort of an expensive and ineffective way to, you know, become more carbon friendly. I refer to them like the, I call it the cupcake diet, right? So offsets are this great idea that you can eat as many cupcakes as you want if you just jog 50 kilometers every night. Well, we end up eating the cupcakes and nobody goes for that run. So offsets are this really slippery place. They'll have their place, but we've overused them just like we overused recycling. and. Climate change, the climate emergency that we're in, and it speaks to a point that Gabriel made earlier, is that it's a problem of consumption, right? We just overused. Oil and gas is a great, amazing tool. We just decided to use it for everything. And just like our overuse of antibiotics, what was a help became a hindrance. We just got too addicted to it. And, you know, Jessica referred to plastics. I mean, Plastics are, they are amazing in certain instances, but we overuse them to the point that we're now poisoned with them, right? I mean, infertility issues, um, cardio, uh, cardiovascular issues, diabetes, all of these related back to microplastics and the toxins that are released from them. So we can do simple things by just buying less. Right. And as businesses, a dollar saved on your expense line is worth two on your revenue line. So you need to find out where you're bleeding carbon and dollars and pull back on that. And what I found is as a business owner, I can explain to people, no, we don't do those signs anymore because they are harmful. We can't recycle them, whatever the reason is. I've yet to have anyone challenge it. Often what I hear from businesses is that they can't charge more or they can't make an, an investment in an environmentally friendly product because their clients won't accept it. So I started referring to these as the unicorn client and I just challenge planners, bring me that client that said no 
to the aluminum cans. Let me talk to them. And what we discovered is it's an, uh, a mindset issue in the mind of the business owner, not in the client. We felt weird or uncomfortable about selling it to our customer. It wasn't the customer pushback. So, you know, my last kind of point is, and this, we ran into this with a hotel recently where they purchased this really expensive solution. Um, they were, pla or, um, they were, uh, it was a takeaway lunch and they went and they purchased um, wooden spoons or, or forks. And they gave me the box and I looked at it and I'm like, well, it was, you know, manufactured, not FSC certified, you basically created a carbon footprint from this. And my question to them was, why didn't you just use the forks and knives that you already had in your inventory? They said, well, it would have been messy. Okay, but what would your grandmother have done? She would have taken the napkins that you already owned, she would have taken the fork and the knife, she would have wrapped them up together, and she'd have given you a bucket or two at the end to throw it into easy, elegant. We see small businesses doing stuff like this all the time. So I always tell businesses, what would your grandmother do? And her first impulse would not be to go out and buy an expensive solution. So that's my, that's my spiel on it. We have, um, one, I think it's a series of questions from the same individual. So thank you, um, Chad, who is in Edmonton. Um, it's awesome, obviously, that we can reach people in, in other provinces. Um, so Chad and his father invented um, aqueduct water systems, and so their drinking water, it's a startup, and it eliminated single-use waste, but it also increased their product, um, sorry, profit markups by 2,600% um, and provides water security in off-grid areas. Um, so it, the suggestion is, it, not sorry, the suggestion it says it's done by utilizing the ubiquity of five-gallon jugs in the series. Um, I think this might be from the same person because it, it goes to this question. Um, so how can we better communicate our sustainable solution to shift from interest and intrigue to actually being utilized and become a business rather than a hobby? Which is actually a really interesting point is you know, being sustainable. You hear about people, I'm going to plant a few things in my backyard this summer so I can be more, more sustainable. So maybe shifting from this idea of a hobby to a business model. Yeah, I want to give Chad some really practical advice. Uh, Chad, I want you to reach out to a woman. Her name is Melissa Radu, and she is the Director of Sustainability for Economic Development Edmonton. And uh, Melissa will not only put you in touch with venues and people that can use this, um, but she can tap you into some markets because economic development is sort of what, what she does. And she's a great lady. So we have to ask, did you say tap because it was related to water or was that totally unintentional? It's it's my brain shutting down. It's almost okay. my bedtime. <laughs> I was I was really impressed. <laughs> now I have to take no, I'm kidding. Yeah, you have to take it all back. <laughs> I take it all back. Just hey, listen, I did not I didn't have any wine with dinner because I knew we were doing this, but it's almost wine time, right? Yeah. Um does anyone else have any, um, actually, Michaela, can I ask you, do you see clients that looked at sustainability as sort of, I don't want to call it a side hustle because that really, the word side hustle really diminishes what people are doing, in, in my opinion, um, but sort of saw it as, I like the idea of, okay, is CSR or sustainability at the periphery or is it at the core of what they did? And I think this speaks to this question. Uh, are you seeing organizations go from uh, sustainability sort of like something we do or we have one person who's the sustainability officer but they're not really part of the, the core decision makers and now it's like no if this has to change or it's at the core um i guess we see we see both to be honest we'll see um we see a variety of different uh, organizations so we can see businesses that have an idea and they have built their company around that sustainable idea and every different aspect is built around that. We do see that. We also do see uh, sole sustainability coordinators or one person that is addressing it. I think when you're dealing with smaller size companies, you usually see it throughout the organization because it is something that everyone's talking about, everyone's passionate about, and it's integrated maybe more than when you're with a like 
medium size or even a large size company, you usually have maybe a team or a one person that is dedicated to it. So I think it depends on the scale of the or the size of the company and then also the uh, the industry as well when you get those uh, differences, I would say. Great. Thanks so much. Um, it's actually 8.30, so tonight has gone exceptionally fast for me. Um, hopefully it went quickly for you <laughs> as well. Um, but I'd just like to say a huge thanks for taking your time um, to lend your expertise and your insights and also just being enjoyable people to talk to for, for an hour and a half as well. I really appreciate it. Um, and wish you all the best for the rest of the semester and the year and I, I think in semesters because of my day job but I know the rest of you do not so in quarters. Uh, yeah. so I think in vintages this is a really yeah. good vintage so far <laughs> <laughs> so we'll say to a wonderful quarter fiscal period and vintages to to all of you and thanks again to unfortunately the people who we are not seeing in person right now um, who attended and, and took part and submitted some great questions as well. Um, so enjoy the rest of your night and thanks again for being part of it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Todd.